Okay. So, we have discussed the uh, first uh, the day before uh, last lecture, uh, two lectures back, we started with uh, basic uh, notions of probability, description probability and then we discussed the axioms. Then the last class started with probability properties, we discussed equally likely outcomes, sample space with equally likely outcomes and then we went for the basic principle of counting and how by using the method of counting we can compute probabilities. And I said that this goes very well with the notion of frequentist probability, okay. that you can count the number of outcomes in repeated experiments and based on that you can find out probability or the likelihood of occurrence of any specific event. Then we uh, discussed what is conditional probability and uh, discussed some examples on that. We discussed the theorem of total probability, which again comes from the conditional probability and something called as the uh, multiplication rule. And we discussed one or two examples on the theorem of total probability as well. So, today's lecture starts with uh, Bayes theorem. I am sure that uh, uh, many of you have heard about Bayes theorem, maybe not all. So, we will go through a basic description of what Bayes theorem is where it came from. So, it came from uh, this uh, British minister uh, known as uh, Thomas Bayes, uh, who was there in 18th century in uh, England and he developed this theorem. So, he comes from a, a theological background that is what he studied also in university. He studied logic and theology and he also studied other things like uh, basic Newtonian methods of uh, mathematics such as calculus. He defended the foundation against various uh, criticism that uh, Newton had received at that time. The other significant work of uh, uh, Thomas Bayes was on the book by De Moivre, which is known as the doctrine of chances. So, Bayes uh, did a lot of work on the uh, concept of chances, concept of probability. These are the initial ages of uh, probability theory and uh, Bayes did a lot of work on that and he published a paper uh, which of course got published after uh, Bayes died and on that uh, I think uh, if I remember correctly the, uh, the paper was called uh, an essay on the doctrine of chances. That means, he was developing on De Moivre's work where he actually gave the idea of uh, Bayes theorem. So, that is where uh, Bayes theorem comes from and uh, it deals with uh, a little bit of conditional probability, total probability etcetera. But today when we uh, talk about Bayes theorem, we do not necessarily mean only that specific theorem that Bayes had formulated some uh, more than 200 years ago. Okay. It has much more wide application when we talk in terms of Bayesian statistics or Bayesian probability. Uh, I, I am not sure if you have heard of these terms, Bayesian statistics and Bayesian probability is a very uh, commonly adopted tool, commonly adopted by scientists, uh, mathematicians, engineers, technologists, everybody, almost everybody, also people in the medical profession. It is a very commonly used one and the uh, applications are really, really wide ranging. Okay. There is a whole group of people known as Bayesians who work in this field. Uh, it has primarily to do with something known as Bayesian inference. You have heard of a statistical inference. So, definitely the Bayesian inference is a subset of the statistical inference, but it has its typical way of looking at things. So, when you talk about Bayesian and you can check this website Bayesian.org. Uh, where you can see what are the uh, kind of ways the Bayesian system of statistics and probability had developed into from the very basic Bayes theorem that was given in 1760s, 1762 or 4. So, this is the uh, Bayes theorem. We go there from uh, the total probability theorem. This is just a recap of the total probability theorem. How is it expressed? We said that if we have uh, these uh, events E 1, E 2 to E n, which are mutually exclusive, 
and collectively exhaustive in a sample space S, then for any event A in the same sample space, you can express the probability for that event A as this. This is the theorem of total probability. Bayes, <coughs> excuse me, Bayes looked at this uh, conditional probability from the reverse direction. Okay. So, we will as we uh, see the Bayes theorem, we will know better why we call it in an inverse probability theorem. So, this is Bayes theorem. So, now we are looking in the reverse direction. Earlier we are finding out what is the probability of A given uh, an event E i. Now, we are looking at what is the probability of an event E i given the occurrence of A. Okay. And Bayes said that this is the theorem, basic theorem. P uh, probability of E i given A is, how do you express that? Of course, it comes from the conditional probability theorem. So, the numerator is nothing but the intersection of A and E i and the denominator is probability of A. Is that okay? Just an extension from the conditional probability theorem. But we are looking in the reverse direction. Okay. So, you may ask, I mean, what is the importance of Bayes theorem? It is same as the conditional probability theorem. If you look at the application, then you will see why it is important sometimes to have a different perspective of the same theorem and look it from a different rather for this case exactly opposite direction. We can also extend that Bayes theorem uh, using the total probability theorem. Now, we are changing the denominator, we are expressing it as the summation of all those multiplications. You remember the multiplication rule where we said that the intersection is nothing but this A given E i times probability of E i. So, we sum up all of those and that is how the denominator is expressed now. So, this is also the same Bayes theorem, just a little different expression. Now, we come to an example and these examples, I hope that will explain uh, things clearly to you, how useful it is to look at a different perspective. At the same thing, look from a different perspective. So, we take the same example that we discussed for total probability, uh, the example of uh, flood in an upstream river and the overflow in a dam uh, downstream, overflow where the river water get stored. Okay. So, again we uh, denote the event of overflow of the dam as O and we know that that event is conditional on the situation in the upstream river, if the river is flooded or not. And we consider the same known probabilities, let us say the statistics that we have is the same. So, that you can see it matches with the conditional probability concepts. So, the reverse order for situations can only be and again only is very important over here, because only means that these are collectively exhaustive. right? Okay. So, flooding with this probability, a normal flood level with that probability and below normal or low flood level with the probability of 20 percent. Okay. Uh, this same as what you have uh, 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 seen earlier. And we also have the same conditional probabilities that the possibility of overflow given that there is flood upstream is 90 percent, possibility of overflow given that its normal water level upstream is 50 percent and possibility of dam overflow given that its low flood level upstream is only 10 percent. So, we have the same basic things. Now, we are looking at a different probability, which is if given that the dam is overflowing. This might be an observation that you make. You see that okay, here is a dam, it is overflowing and now we want to know what is the condition in the upstream river. What is the chance that the upstream river has flooded, given that it is overflowing downstream at the dam. Or we could find in the same way, what is the chance that it has a normal flood level in the upstream river, given that it has not overflown or it has overflown in the dam downstream. Okay. So, the probability that we are trying to find out over here is probability f given O, probability of flooding in the upstream river given it is overflowing in the dam. And we just simply apply the Bayes theorem, uh, we know the formula. So, in the numerator we have probability of O given f times probability of f and in the denominator we have the 
summation. Summation again comes from the total probability. So, what is the denominator? What does the denominator give you? Is the probability of overflowing of the dam. It's the total probability of overflowing. Earlier we computed this parameter only. The total likelihood of overflowing of a dam given all kinds of situations in the upstream river. Now, we are saying that okay, the dam has overflown. What is the possible situation in the upstream river? So, you find out this probability given the dam has overflown and you can compute it very easily based on the known conditional probabilities and original probabilities. By conditional, I mean this and original, I mean these. We go to the second example and these type of examples from medical tests are usually the most commonly cited examples to explain Bayes theorem. So, in medical case uh, test is uh, the uh, concept of false positives or false negatives are very common. If you are not aware of it, this is what it means. A false positive means that a person actually does not have a disease, but the medical test says that he or she has the same disease. Okay. So, let us say you go and uh, get a, a test for having cancer. Okay. The real situation is that you do not have cancer, but the specific test for checking if you have cancer or not says that you do have cancer. Okay. So, that is a case of false positive. And uh, uh, see, we are coming to uh, Bayesian inference. Based on this test, a doctor has to decide if a patient really have a disease or not. Okay. So, that kind of inference comes from using the Bayes theorem and we will see how. So, let us say these are the different probabilities. These are the different events. Okay. So, uh, the person actually having the disease, we denote it with D. So, automatically the person not having the disease, same person not having the disease will automatically be denoted with the complementary event D C. right? And the outcome of the uh, medical test, if it says yes, the person has the disease is denoted by Y and if the test says no, is denoted by N. So, these are the four different events, four different outcomes of the same sample set. Well, usually not, but you can construct a sample set having all this. You can define your own sample set depending on the type of experiment that you want. Uh, Let us look at the uh, conditional probabilities. Let us assume that what is the uh, uh, likelihood that the test gives you correct results. So, the medical test says yes, given the patient actually having the disease is 99 percent, but sometimes the tests go wrong. That means, even when the patient does not have the disease, that means the event D C, even with that sometimes the test says yes, it gives you wrong result and the probability of that is 5 percent. Now, if we from this, if we infer that only 5 percent of positive results are false, that would be wrong. But notionally, if you look at the uh, those two bullets and the second one specifically, P yes given no disease is 5 percent. So, we tend to say that, well, the positives are positive results are wrong in 5 percent of cases. Okay. But, we if we do a proper calculation based on Bayes theorem, we will see that this is not really the case. For an example, we take the case of a rare disease, uh, where only 0.2 percent of people is found to have a, that disease. Okay. So, probability of having that disease for any person is only 0 0.002. And you are trying to find out what is the probability of having a false positive result. Okay. And by false positive, we mean that given the test had said yes, but the patient does not have that disease. Okay. So, probability of D C no disease given Y. Okay. So, we apply Bayes theorem. So, probability of D C given Y can be calculated as probability of Y given D C times probability of D C and we have these values, these individual values we have with us. We have this, we have this. In the denominator, we have the total probability of having a yes result from the test, which is probability of y given d c times probability of d c plus 
probability of y given d, that means the person has the disease times probability of d. So, you put these values and the result is 96.2 percent. So, very different from the 5 percent that notionally we would think. Okay. So, I will get back again and repeat this. This is what you see that the conditional probability of y given d c is only 5 percent, but if you actually compute what is the case where you have a false positive result, it is not only 5 percent, but 96.2 percent over here based on Bayes theorem. Okay. So, you can see for a rare disease, you can have a lot of false positive results. The more rare the event is, it is more likely that the test would wrongly say yes. Does it seem reasonable to you now, if I say it that way? I will repeat again. The more rare a disease is, it will be more likely to have a false positive. That means, the test would wrongly say yes, even if the patient does not have the disease. Okay. And what we do? Uh, we change the probability of that uh, uh, disease. Okay. Let us say the disease was very common. 25 percent of people generally have that disease. Okay. If you do the same computation, now you are changing P D by 0.25 and not changing anything else. By anything else, I mean yes. Uh, so, P y given D and y given D C remains same. You still might say on the basic notion that 5 percent of the positive results are false. Instead of having P D equal to 0 0.002, now we say that P D is 25 percent. Okay. If you do the same counting, then the probability of having false positive goes down to 13.2 percent, a huge change from more than 96 to 13.2 percent, still more than 5 percent, it is not 5 percent. No. So, what we see over here is that the number of false positives really depend on what is the likelihood of a person having the disease, that P D or P D C, that changes the whole calculation. So, this is basically, uh, uh, this gives you an essence of what Bayes theorem looks like and what its applications are. Also, Bayes theorem is applied a lot for uh, similar uh, examples such as uh, updating a model. What is a model? A model is what describes a system. A system always has some uncertainties as we have discussed earlier. So, the systems will have conditional probabilities you can apply total probability theorem, etcetera, etcetera. So, every system we try to explain that system, the function of that system with some kind of a model. Using Bayes theorem, we can do model updating based on new evidences. Okay. Later on, if I find time, I will discuss some examples of Bayesian model updating based on new informations. Or if you do a quick search on these things, uh, on internet, you will find examples such as another very common example for uh, explaining Bayesian theorem and Bayesian model updating is that, uh, let us say a trial going on in a courtroom and uh, the juries give some verdict. Okay. So, many percentage says okay, uh, that person is the criminal has committed the crime, the others say that no, she or he has not committed the crime. And then you have some additional information based on, let us say, some uh, test, DNA test or some other evidence okay, coming in. So, now you can add that information to the basic model, which was the information only coming from the juries, and you will have a new system using which you can uh, estimate. I would not use the uh, word predict you can estimate likelihood of different events for this case, if a person is criminal or not or has committed the crime or not. You can estimate those events or likelihood of those events in a more uh, uh, rational sense, in a better sense, because you are updating the model based on the new evidences available. So, that is all Bayesian statistics for you now. We move on to something else. 
we move on to the concept of random variables, which is very essential for uh, this course. And random variables are very essential for uh, describing anything regarding probability. You might have heard of this random variables, probability distributions, some distributions we are going to go through in this course, you must be already familiar with. We will see how these things are. Uh, we first go through a definition and again a random variable really does not need a definition. It is better to have a sense of what a random variable is, okay. but uh, as customer I give a definition here. So, a random variable is defined to be something that maps sample events into intervals in the axis of real numbers. Okay. You, are, you are familiar with the concept of mapping, are you? Mapping, uh, let us raise hands, how many of you have used or heard the term mapping? Okay. So, mapping is kind of a translation okay, or even transformation. Uh, you have one set of items over here, you have another set of items over here, you have a mapping system which translates or transforms items from this set to that set. That is what mapping is. Let us take the example of what we call one to one mapping. Let us say on uh, one set you have uh, five items named A, B, C, D, E. Uh, let me go to the, uh, let me try to use a diagram to explain this. So, this is set 1, this is set 2. From set 1 to set 2, we can have a 1 to 1 mapping. So, that means each item in set 1 will have a corresponding item in the other set. So, these arrows represent what we call mapping. It is a part of transformation geometry. Are you familiar with transformation geometry? Again, raise your hands. Yes. Okay. So, mapping gives kind of an one to one correspondence, not in the uh, uh, both directions, but usually in one direction. Let us get back. So, basically what we are trying over here is to say that a random variable is a translator and interpreter of events on to numbers. Okay. It is a numerical interpretation of events. Okay. So, you have this axis of real numbers. So, events or outcomes in an event can be represented as numbers by the random variable. Okay. So, here we have the event. and these are corresponding representations by the random variable. Okay. So, these are numbers here. This is what the random variable is doing, it is translating those event, the outcomes in an event into numbers. Uh, to explain things uh, through another diagram, here is what we have. Uh, so, S is nothing but the sample space. In S, we have two sample events E and F and the random numbers X and Y, what they are doing? They are representing E on the axis of real numbers and F on the axis of real numbers. So, E is getting represented by this line and again F is represented by this part. So, these are two intervals. The random number x translates the event E into this interval and y does the same for the event f. This is the interval of f. So, is the concept clear now? What a random variable is? Okay. Again, as I say, it is not very important to have a specific definition for uh, 
a random variable, we, when we start using it, we know how it is. And many of you must be familiar with different random variables and different distributions as well. So, there are typically two types of random variables, discrete and continuous. So, what I would like uh, to know, uh, I want some examples of uh, these random variables from you, discrete random variables, continuous random variables. Just raise your hand, I will ask uh, the uh, uh, TAs to go to you with a mic. So, can I have some volunteers? Example of a discrete random variable, very simple question. Give me an example of a discrete random variable. The height of six students, it mm -hmm. would be a student, students you can say age and height, we can plot that as a discrete. Should function. be a discrete one? Yes sir. How? Explain. We can't take 18 and half as age, we take 18, 19, 20 like that. So, it age? will be discrete. Yes sir. Why not? 18 years, 3 months, well, it's 17 wish. days, hours, well, it depends minutes, how we seconds. Wish to, still we can't make but it usually, continuous. Give me more uh, understandable. There is a limit to making it small sir. I, I agree, but give me more understandable explanations, examples. Yeah. Oh, no, give me one more, then I will go to another person. Well, the weight versus height, <laughs> weight versus height. Again, why, <laughs> what kind of. Uh, what kind of numbers you can assign to it? I mean, you can assign any number, right? So, that is more like a continuous and a variable. Depending upon the result of a match, it can either be a win or a draw or a loss. Yeah, uh, these are minus discrete. Minus 1 can be, uh, can denote a loss, 0 a draw and 1 a win. So Even if you do not assign specific numbers, of course, and variables are supposed to numbers, we can first see that, okay, these are events where the outcomes can only take a few values okay? and the random variable and then we will translate these values to certain numbers. Like he said, okay, winning a match we will have some value, having a draw we will have some value and losing the match we will have some other value. So, these are discrete. Okay? What about continuous? We already have the examples. Okay? Uh, height of a student in this class, age of a student in this class, unless of course, you want to group it into things like, okay, uh, age of a student being 18 to 19 is one event, age of a student being 19 to 20 another event. So, then it becomes discrete. Okay. Otherwise, things are continuous when you are discussing age and height. There are specific uh, 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 functions, basic functions which we use a lot to describe a random variable. Uh, which are the probability mass function, cumulative distribution function and probability density function. And we will go to the definitions of each of these. So, the probability mass function many a times we will just use the abbreviated term PMF is the probability that a discrete, it is important to note that it is discrete random variable only. So, the probability that a discrete random variable x is equal to a specific value x where small x is a real number. Note that we are denoting a random variable by the capital letter and the value it can take by the small letter. So, these are very common uh, uh, system of notation and I would suggest you to follow the same that you will always use a random variable with a capital letter as far as possible and the numbers it can take if you want to represent that number as a variable use a small letter for that. Okay. So, the PMS is represented as this one small p with subscript x and within parenthesis you have small x. This is capital X. So, it says that this is the probability of capital X PMF at a value x. So, PMF of random variable x at value small x, which is nothing but the probability that the random variable x can take a value small x, that is the probability of mass function. Then you go to cumulative distribution function or the CDF, which is the probability that a discrete or continuous random variable x is less than or equal to small x. Okay. The common notation for CDF, cumulative distribution function, 
is capital F and again you have a similar notation in the subscript we write capital X which represents the random variable X and the value is evaluated at small x. Okay? When it is evaluated at small x, it means that it is the probability that the random variable is less than equal to small x. CDFs are defined both for discrete and continuous random variables. Okay? Very important to note that one as well. The third one that we have is the probability density function or PDF. It is defined at the first derivative of the CDF, that means the cumulative distribution function. And uh, you can easily see that since it is defined as a derivative, it has to be for the continuous random variable. Okay. For the discrete, you can find out the derivative. So, <coughs> the basic notation for a PDF, small f with a subscript again capital X evaluated at x. So, this is nothing but the first derivative with respect to x of course of the CDF of the same random variable. Okay. We will evaluate it at that value at that point x. So, basically again you say that it is the slope of the CDF, PDF is the slope of the CDF. And if you look at the other direction, you can also find out the CDF cumulative distribution function by integrating the PDF over x from minus infinity to the value where you are evaluating the function. Okay. The same equation written in two different ways, both are very useful and we will see how. I will just try to uh, give you some uh, examples and show you how CDFs and PDFs are related. By the way, uh, Remember that uh, the D for CDF and the D for PDF, they do not represent the same thing. CDF is cumulative distribution function and PDF is probability density function. Okay. So, typically you will see that when you are plotting a, a CDF which is f x and uh, let us say I will just have this line. We are plotting uh, PDF. What will be the uh, uh, horizontal axis? What will we have in the horizontal axis? Numbers, because random variables, the functions are evaluated where? At small x, that means small x is a number, random variables translate the events to numbers. Okay. So, coming back to this, uh, let me uh, not very large, let me have a break. Okay. These are two different diagrams. So, uh, uh, probability density functions look somewhat like this. And this is x, this is also x. And the cumulative distribution function, which you obtain by integrating this, would be what? For any given part, it will go something like this. Does it make sense? The CDF will gradually increase because what is CDF? If you count up to, let us say, a value A, CDF is the if I uh, get back over here, CDF is the integration from minus infinity to A, right? So, this area, let us call this area A at A. So, similarly at a value when the CDF is evaluated at A, this should be the same area. Okay. So, the value of the CDF at any given value small a is nothing but the area under the PDF from minus infinity up to that value a. Okay. 
So, it comes from the basic definition of slope and integration. Let us get back. Okay. Uh, we try to cite some examples. Uh, first, we try with the probability mass function, which is defined for discrete numbers. <coughs> we take the example of uh, number of students attending this class today. Uh, what is uh, when we evaluate it at the value 5, 13, that means that we are trying to find out the probability that the number of student exactly is 5, 13 over here. So, first of all check, is it the case of a discrete random variable? Yes, of course, it will be only whole numbers, positive whole numbers, etcetera. So, small p of random variable x, which we see as a subscript over here, evaluated at this number 5, 13 is nothing but the probability that x equal to 513. What do you think the probability is today? 0? Definitely 0. Is it 0 most of the days? Why? Is it because uh, you never see more than 500 students or is it because something else? So, let us say if it is a, a, a fair case, you know unbiased case that if the total uh, student strength for this class is 750, what is the likelihood that uh, uh, one student comes or two students come? Let us say for each, if they are all equally likely outcomes, the likelihood of each of these events p x at 1, p x at 2 or p x at 3, p x at 750 will be equal to 1 over 750 based on the basic principle of counting. right? So, a very low probability for any number. You pick 530, no, you pick 200, you pick 13, you pick 713, does not really matter. Based on the theory, if these are all equally likely outcomes, then the probability of x being equal to any number is very low, which is 1 over 750. And with only 30 lectures a semester, you would hardly see you hardly put, uh, uh, you know, I mean any probability to any number, the probabilities are so low. Of course, this is not really a case of equally likely outcomes, right. Do you think the probability that there are uh, 150 students today is same as there are uh, 700 students today? I do not think they are same, okay. But anyway, it gives you the idea of what is the probability mass function. We go to CDF. Again, cite uh, another uh, example. Take the previous one. X uh, uh, is a random variable representing the number of students attending the class today. It's evaluated at 2010. So, probability X less than equal to 2010. What do you think the value of the CDF is? 1? In any of the days, it is 1? Yes? So, you can this way evaluate various functions like PMF and CDF. The second example is from a continuous random variable. In civil engineering, we use uh, reinforced concrete as a very common material and to have reinforced concrete, we use reinforced concrete in buildings, bridges, constructing anything. Uh, the first thing that you need is concrete, you are familiar with concrete right? and by uh, changing the ratio of the constituents of concrete, you can have different strength of that concrete. So, before you use any concrete in a, a real construction, you always test concrete and how do you test it? We uh, prepare uh, sample cubes. Okay? These are uh, 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter cubes of concrete. We prepare several of them and we test them. How do we test them? we put them in a compression testing machine and just press it hard enough and see what is the pressure that we applied when the cube crushes. Okay. So, that is compression testing and that is the strength of a concrete cube, that is the mode of evaluation of the strength of the concrete that you are preparing. Now, we do several tests of course, because it is a statistical situation and we do not get the same strength for all the cubes, obviously we do not. 
and you do some uh, probability calculation to see if it's okay to use this concrete or not. Now, uh, this term M25 grade concrete, uh, we have certain proportion of the ingredients to get M25 concrete, which is a concrete which should have or which is designed to have as crushing strength 25 mega Pascal, 25 Newton per millimeter square. Okay. Now, of course, if you test 5, some will be 25, some will be 24.9, some will be 23, some can even be 30 mega Pascals. Okay. So, is it a case of continuous random variable? The strength of concrete C, is it a continuous random variable? Yes. Right. It can take any number in certain range. It does not have to have the full range from minus infinity to plus infinity, but it should be continuous in certain intervals. That is what makes a continuous random variable. So, the CDF of C that means strength which is the random variable evaluated at 26 means that the strength of the concrete cube is less than 26 mega Pascal. Uh, here is a, a something I would like you to note. Uh, random variables do not have units. Okay. So, we do not write that C less than equal to 26 mega Pascal. Ideally, that is how random variables are defined. We said that it interprets events into numbers, pure numbers. But as engineers, we may uh, many a times put some units to a random variable to make things a little uh, easily understandable for us. Okay. So, these are examples for PMF and CDF. What about example of uh, uh, PDF? Can anybody volunteer and give an example of a PDF? I think I will continue and see. Okay. Well, some basic properties of uh, these functions. CDF and PMF defines a probability. It is probability of x being something, probability of x being less than or equal to something. So, you can apply the probability axioms to this. So, for example, we have the CDF of x has to be Less, greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 1. This comes from the axioms of probability. Also, CDF is a non decreasing function. That means, for x 1 less than x 2, the CDF at x 1 has to be less than or equal to CDF at x 2. Okay. I will uh, get back to the previous plots. So, you can see the uh, CDF over here. Uh, Let us say this is x 1 less than x 2. So, this is f at x 1 and this is f at x 2. Since you are adding on area as you go ahead in the uh, PDF plot, so you can see that f at x 2 cannot be less than f at x 1. Is that okay? It is cumulative in nature. It has to be non decreasing. We do not say increasing because PDF or PMF might be 0 at certain range. So, it has to at least remain at that level, but it can never be less than what it was for a lower value. Again from the axioms, we have CDF at minus infinity equal to 0 okay, has to be and CDF at plus infinity equal to 1. Plus infinity means you have included all the possible outcomes, the whole sample set has been included. So, it is 1. For continuous random variables, probability that x is within A and B is nothing but CDF at B minus CDF at A which can also be expressed at the integration from A to B of the PDF of x. Okay? And zeta is nothing but a dummy variable. So, a quick one, I think I will go this way now. So, this is F PDF and this is CDF. So, A, B, This is the area which is okay. 
this is F A and this is F at B. Okay, makes sense. Is the integration of the area between those two points where it's evaluated? So similarly, if you integrate the uh, PDF over the whole range minus infinity plus infinity, you get one. And finally, say that a PDF doesn't define a probability. You see that dimension-wise, what is CDF? CDF is what you get by integrating the PDF. So they don't have the same dimension. So if CDF expresses a probability of x being less than or equal to some value, then PDF cannot be a probability. That is why if I ask you to give an example for PDF, can you give one? Not as an example for probability, okay? like you can give for PMF or CDF. Uh, here we do a very uh, uh, quick example. Uh, we have a PDF for a function for random variable x. So, it is defined as this uh, function b times x square minus 2 x for that range for x being uh, from 2 to 4 and 0 otherwise. We want to find out the value of b. We use the axiom, the properties. We use that from minus infinity to plus infinity. If you integrate the PDF, we will get 1. So, basically it turns out to an integration from 2 to 4 and from that if we evaluate the integral, we can get the value of b equal to 0.15 from this equation. Now, you come to the concept of jointly distributed uh, random variables. Uh, so, for your discussing random variables separately, sometimes you may need to find out the occurrences, likelihood of occurrences of two events together or more than two events together. For example, we say that if x, the random variable x denotes the strength of material of a machine and y, the number of operation cycles. So, what happens as the machine goes to various cycles? its strength, strength of the material goes down. How much it can take? That value goes down. So, you might like to see how many operation cycles have gone through and what is the current strength of the material of the machine. Uh, similarly, I go uh, to another example. If x is the total rainfall in a basin and y represents the flood in the downstream river. Again, you might like to see what are the joint probability of this being high flood and this being overflow in the uh, uh, basin and so on. So, joint CDFs we express this way very similar to the CDF of a single random variable. Here you have a joint probability of x being less than or equal to small x and y being less than or equal to small y. Similarly, joint probability mass function we also have x being equal to x and y being equal to y. Similar notations we have two random variables here as the subscript and two values of those random variables in that order within the parenthesis. And also a joint PDF, which is obtained by taking the partial derivative twice of the CDF with respect to x and with respect to y. Okay. And you can inversely obtain the CDF, joint CDF of the random variables x and y. You can evaluate that at x equal to a and y equal to b by doing an integration. And what is the limit of integration? You integrate from minus infinity to a for x minus infinity to b for y. I think I should have changed this uh, order, it should be dy dx. Properties, you can obtain the CDF of x only if you consider the whole range of y. Okay. Y is infinity. If we evaluate the joint CDF at y equal to infinity, that means you are considering all the y. So, we do not have to consider y because that part becomes 1, the whole sample space for y. So, that remains only the CDF of x. Similarly, you can get the CDF of y only by considering the whole range of x, x up to infinity. And the mass function individual mass function can be obtained by considering all those j values. Look at the third expression for the joint PMF. Okay. And you can extend this to the uh, continuous random variable as well. 
you have to replace the joint PMF by joint PDF and instead of summing you have to do an integration from minus infinity to plus infinity for one variable let us say y, then you will get the function only for x. A uh, simple examples, I uh, will stop over here probably, uh, why sometimes you think that joint mass functions may be important, okay? not a very realistic one. So, here we are looking at how many wild boars obelix hunt a day and similarly how many Romans he let us say hunts a day. Okay? We are looking at the joint probabilities of different things. So, in terms of wild boars, we are looking at the whole sample set less than 2 between 2 to 4 and greater than 4. Okay? So, these individual numbers, let us say take this one, this is a joint mass function of hunting wild boar less than 2 and hunting romans less than 10. Okay. Similarly, 0 0.15 hunting wild boars from 2 to 4 and romans less than 10. See this has the whole sample set for wild boars, this has the whole sample set for romans. Right? So, you can have this matrix, it is a two dimensional matrix, if you have three random variables you can have a three dimensional matrix. What is interesting to note over here is that this summation of this row, this one, this one and this one, what is that probability? What is this 0 0.3? 30 percent is the probability of number of Romans being less than 10, okay? 50 percent probability of number of Romans being 10 to 20 and similarly you can have also in this direction. So, when you are summing up the rows, what we are doing is we are considering the whole sample set for the other one that means the wild boars. So, you have this one. Similarly, you can sum up the columns and get this one which is the probability for wild boars only independent of Romans. Okay. And if you sum in this direction either way or this direction either way, you get one because in both directions we are considering the whole sample space. Okay. Thank you.